Welcome to the 2024 Zoological Podcasters Summit. Hello, I'm John Rossi. I'm a touring drummer with a passion for animal conservation. When I'm on the road, I spend as much time as possible visiting zoos, aquariums, and conservation organizations. Now, I want to share those places with you. I'll be talking to keepers, vets, conservationists, anyone who can help me in my mission of connecting my people to animals through their people. Join me on my raw safari. Hi, hello, hello, and welcome back to a very special episode of the Raw Safari Podcast. Y'all, I am so excited today to have two wonderful people sharing the podcast stage with me. Uh, today you're going to be hearing from a guest who you've heard from before, Elizabeth Johnson, who is at the Naples Zoo, but more importantly for today's purposes, is the host of the Mothering Wildlife podcast, which is a podcast that is all about being a mother in the zoological field and in the wider wildlife field. And y'all, I had such a hard time saying wider wildlife field. I, I kept stumbling and saying wilder, wilder life field. So yeah. Anyway, uh, it's an amazing podcast. I am proud to be uh, the producer of it. And um, Elizabeth is just amazing. And then my other guest, guest is actually appearing on the podcast for the very first time, and I am very excited to have him here, and that is Chris Jenkins. And Chris Jenkins is one of the very important people at Natural Encounters, Inc., NEI, uh, the company run by Steve Martin that is just legendary for the amazing training work they do. But uh, again, the reason that Chris is actually on the podcast today is because he is the co-host of the NEI Tech Talk podcast. And uh, so we are here to talk all about what life is like as a zoological podcaster. We each answer a bunch of questions, including sharing, um, you know, how we make these, what uh, has inspired us, how our podcasts have grown, what some of the challenges and what some of the perks of, of being zoological podcasters uh, have been for all all of us. And um, I'm, I'm really excited. This is a long chat. It is a fun chat. We get into some very tech things near the end. If you've ever thought of starting a podcast, definitely uh, hang on for that section. But um, yeah, it was a lot of fun to collaborate with these two and to uh, share what we do with all of you. And uh, the interview you're about to hear is going to be shared on Mothering Wildlife and on the Tech Talk podcast as well. So I encourage you to make sure that you've signed up for those. And I think it would be really fun. I doubt anyone wants to listen to the interview three times, but uh, to go and hear what their intros are going to be and what they're going to have to say about everything. I think it'll be kind of fun to, to, to experience that. Also, for those of you who are wondering, yes, there are two names that uh, as soon as you, you saw that this was going to be a podcaster summit, you probably expected to be hearing. And those names are Daisy and Tess uh, from our, our friends at Trainer Talks and Tales over in Australia. And y'all, we tried and they tried, but uh, life was just not very accommodating, especially with the time zone differences. But we do love Daisy and Tess so much. And uh, of course, if you're not uh, listening to, you know, Trainer Talks and Tales, then make sure that you are going and listening to them as well. Because honestly, I, I really missed having their presence on this podcast. Um, but it's an amazing podcast and I want y'all to go listen to it. So yeah. All right. This is a very long episode. So without further ado, we're going to get to it. Uh, here is my interview with uh, me, Elizabeth Johnson and Chris Jenkins. Enjoy. All right, so let's get this ball rolling. Why doesn't everybody introduce themselves and what podcast you're with and all of that? Sure, I'll jump in. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Johnson, and I am the host of the Mothering Wildlife podcast. We talk about mainly zoo moms, motherhood, and being a zoo employee, but um, we have talked to a couple of people outside of the zoo field, and I would love to talk to more of them outside of the zoo field. But yeah, we just focus on being a mom in this crazy field. 
And hello, my name is Chris Jenkins. I am one of the hosts of the Tech Talk podcast presented by Natural Encounters Incorporated. So we are the uh, official podcast, I guess, of NEI, um, the company run by Steve Martin that does animal training and bird show stuff and all kinds of animal behavior stuff all over the world. And uh, I'm the chief operating officer of that company. And when COVID changed everything for everything we were doing and we were deciding about what new online offerings we could offer until we figured out what the future was going to look like. I immediately raised my hand and said, I want to host a podcast. And then my co-host raised her hand and said, I want to be your co-host. And we said, okay. And our boss said, I don't care. And then we started doing it the next day. So (laughs) we just passed 200 episodes and we are excited to be here. Nice. And uh, uh, for those listening on the other feeds, I am John Rossi. I'm the host of the Rossafari podcast, which is an adorable name that really doesn't work when I'm trying to get people to listen to it because they're like, what's the name again? Uh, (laughs) But I do a weekly interview episode where I interview somebody in the zoo aquarium conservation world. Uh, And then I also do a weekly zoo news episode where I do uh, some light dives and some deep dives into everything going on in that world uh, as far as what's happened like in the news that week we talk about births and deaths and uh, cool things that facilities are doing and sometimes the the viral videos that happen that we we love or hate and you know just kind of talk about all of that so yeah and uh, I want to thank y'all for uh, for coming and hanging out and, and doing this to talk about what it's like to be a zoological podcaster Um, so why don't we start off by everybody kind of saying, I mean, Chris, you already cheated and did this, but, uh, why, why you started the podcast? (laughs) Um, hi, it's Elizabeth. I, you know, a couple of years ago I was pregnant and a coworker of mine was also pregnant and, you know, we were working our zoo job and we just kind of kept having the same conversation of, man, this job and all that it encompasses in the zoo field with, you know, as a keeper, especially the physical labor that's involved, you know, the mental and the emotional energy that you're putting into caring for living beings. Um, it We were just like, this job is, is just nuts to then also be a pregnant woman and to be a mom. We also both had children at that time. And we were like, kind of feel like, you know, we're doing so much caring for wildlife and caring for living beings at the zoo. And then we go home to our homes and we're caring for children, which are another version of wildlife because they can be a little crazy. And it was like, wouldn't it be great to kind of like talk to other moms about this? I know they're out there. It would be really cool to like tell their stories and just talk to them and kind of try to create this little community of zoo moms so that you can we can all kind of like not commiserate because that's not the right word, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> but some of that happens. But, you know, so that we can all kind of just like we, we all are experiencing the same thing. And, you know, as a as a mom and as a parent, really, it's not just moms. You sometimes feel a little isolated and alone and to have other people around you who are going through similar things whether it's when you have littles or you have, you know, older children is just really helpful. (laughs) So that's where the genesis of this podcast idea came from. Um, And then we started up about, let's see, I think it was July of 2023. So we're, I mean, I'm a tiny little baby podcast or not quite a year almost. Um, But yeah, that's, that's kind of where the idea came from and how it got started. And I could provide a little bit more context than just that. I guess you're right. I did sort of spoil it a little bit. But <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it, it, as anybody who, you know, was on planet Earth four years ago remembers, everything got real weird real fast. And um, for a lot of folks who worked in the zoological industry, at the majority, I think there was at least some period of time where our facilities were shut down. And um, very few that I know of across the world continued operation. I have talked to a couple, which is wild to me when I think about how much everything changed. But some people were in places that were pretty isolated, and they had pretty outdoor operations where folks didn't really need to interact. So they were able to pull it off. But so we do a, a couple shows at a big theme park in Central Florida, and those got shut down. So we had to move all of our animals about 40 miles to our home base. And we were sort of sitting around figuring out what to do. And my boss felt really strongly that we needed to continue to find a way to keep people connected, share information, be a part of our overall field. So we we came up with this idea of doing webinars about a variety of animal training and behavior topics. Um, 
the more we talked about it, it, it felt like it was almost becoming a new branch of our company. It was all of the educational stuff we did. We talked about doing online courses. Um, we talked about doing a podcast. We talked about doing, you know, virtual consulting um, as because animal training consulting is a lot of what we do. So this all fell under this blanket that ended up becoming known as NEI Tech TEC Training and Education Center, which is it's it works in a couple of different ways. One of them is a bit of gallows humor because Right before um, the pandemic started in 2020, uh, we had just about completed construction on a 6,000 square foot training and education facility at our home base in Winter Haven, Florida. And we were super excited to have everybody come see our great new educational center. (laughs) And then the planet shut down. So we had this gorgeous new building, this great lecture hall and this amazing meeting room um, that just we couldn't use other than for ourselves for a while. So um but we hit the ground running with that stuff, and uh, there were four or five of us who were full-time work from home because of health issues mainly uh, or compromises in family members that we lived with. And uh, so it, as a result, I was all of a sudden sitting in front of a computer for you know 10 to 12 hours, seven days a week, and um, as we were trying to figure out how to split up everybody else on their schedules. So um, the podcast just became a thing that we thought would be a fun outlet for – Um, for animal training and behavior information. But I think very quickly we realized what we were both most interested in as co-hosts and we've known each other for years and years and years and years um, was the people side of things and ultimately how we can apply the animal training, you know, positive reinforcement upper conditioning principles that we use with our animals to other people. And um, so I always tell people when I explain what we do, I say, well, ostensibly it's an animal training podcast, but really it's a show about human behavior, teamwork, communication, relationships. And, um, and we've just skewed hard in that direction and we kind of haven't looked back. <laughs> so every now and again, we'll sit down and go like, we really should talk about something that involves animal behavior this week, right? Because it's been like a month before we even said the word bird or zoo. Um, We've just been talking to leaders and curators and supervisors or people who are brand new to the field who don't know what they're looking for exactly and want advice. So that's kind of the little niche I think we've fallen into. Very cool. Yeah. And uh, my story is is similar with the the COVID being what launched it thing. Um, but uh, so, you know, my day job is that I am a touring drummer and uh, I go around doing shows all around the country. And uh, I, there's a lot of toxicity in that world. And so I found um, a lot of uh, mental peace by going to zoos and aquariums when I was on the road. And um, as I started talking to like zookeepers at these facilities, and I was just asking like, yo, what's the name of your red panda or whatever, um, they would start talking and people really like sharing about their animals. And um, it was always fascinating. The stories were always fascinating. And people who seemed almost apprehensive when you were like, hi, uh, when, when they start talking about their animals, would get really excited and start sharing and, and oversharing and all the things. And I remember thinking that, um, I, I wanted to, I listened to a ton of podcasts on the tour bus and I was like, Ooh, I need to find this podcast. And there really wasn't one there, some kind of almost that ish things, but nothing that, that satisfied what I was looking for. And I remember thinking it would be really cool to do, but you know, life on a tour bus and, um, and then COVID hit. And an entire year of bookings disappeared on a single day. And I was sitting at home completely alone. Uh, I had no no humans or animals where I was at that time. And um, my brain was breaking a little bit. And uh, somebody had mentioned that they really liked the show BoJack Horseman, which is like a cartoon and I thought was really funny. Uh, so I binged it. And it turns out that it is a very serious thing that deals with a lot of like mental health issues and stuff. It's a great show. I love it. But it is the worst thing to watch when your brain is breaking. Uh, It assisted with the breaking. And so I I was literally sitting there and I was like, I need to do something because my mental health is not going to be in a good place right now. And uh, and I remembered that podcast that I had thought about. And I was like, oh, I'm going to do this. And being a musician, I walked upstairs to my drum room and I grabbed some extra mics that I had and some cables and some gear. And I started plugging it all into my laptop and uh, I I had a recording set up just like that. And I had to learn a lot of other stuff 
Uh, but yeah, and I had, I'd already started an Instagram, uh, you know, at Ross Safari where I shared zoo pics from around the country and I had met some keepers through that. So I reached out to them and was like, Hey, is this something you think might work and you'd be interested in? And they, they all said yes. And so I was able to get some interviews and, and launch from there. So yeah. The rest is history. Yeah. And I've been doing two episodes a week plus sometimes bonus episodes and like patron content and stuff. So I think I have out over 400 uh individual episodes at this point which is insane um yeah yeah, it's it's a lot (laughs) elizabeth we're gonna have to take him down so we can catch up (laughs) yeah that definitely beats my like 34 (laughs) and i've also i've also never like i get seasons and i get that people do that but i love what i do so much that i've just never taken a break i'm technically in my fourth season but uh you know the 52nd week of the third season ended and then the first (laughs) week of the fourth (laughs) season began so i keep saying one of these days i'm gonna take a break but here we are instead I mean, if you love what you're doing, then it doesn't feel like work, you know, it's no. easy to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, very cool. I'm I'm curious, uh, you know, Chris, you talked about the evolution of the pod a little bit. And I, so I'm curious uh, for, for everyone here, um, what, like, how did you find that your podcast evolved? Um, well, I, I think part of it was, you know, we, I think we went in with the attitude that um, you know, because there was so little planning involved at the outset, I had I had some experience with podcasting. Some friends and I had done a video game podcast for a, a many years, uh, starting in like 2012. Wow! Um, and I'm which made me shudder when I was explaining somebody to that at work because I thought about how old some of my coworkers were at that point when I, I started doing that. And I just, I couldn't think too hard about that, but um, so I, I knew a little, I knew enough about the behind the scenes stuff to do all the technical stuff. So, you know, not that they've, you know, the barrier for entry for this stuff is so low now. Like there's so many great tools people have easy access to, but I knew I could do that. And it was a thing we'd kind of kicked around a little bit. I just like, like you said, John, I, I did it because it was fun. Like the, my friends and I never had a second's thought about who was listening how we could get listenership up, what the numbers were like. It was just the, the, the observation was I was talking to these guys anyway. And I think it was my wife who was like, you're, you're doing this all the time. Anyhow, why don't you just record it? I know you like podcasts. This sounds like you're doing what these people do. I don't know enough about it, but so um, one Christmas, she just bought me this little hundred dollar kit that had a little mixing board and a mic and, you know, an arm stand and some cords and said, here, figure it out. And so when we started the show, because we literally started like the next day, we recorded an episode zero just saying, hey, we're thinking about doing this thing. It's going to start next week. We wanted to put something out that could at least gather some sort of an audience. Um, and and then we did. And we just started the next week. And I think um, because there was so little planning involved, we got excited that there was an improvisational angle to it where we said this is going to be conversations we're having with people uh and if we make mistakes we make mistakes like we're people like this is not going to be perfect we're not going to uh, obsess over what other people's microphones sound like although i will find i have gotten weirdly intolerant of when people don't have good sounding audio. oh yeah it's all about the audio <laughs> yeah, i'm sure that's a much bigger part of your life than it is most people john but like um but you know, we, we never wanted to script anything. We, we have scripted a couple things in so much as another party required it. You know, we've had those couple recordings where it's the two of us talking to someone else, but there's like a fourth or fifth person in the room from PR or something who is just, I don't know, ready to pull the plug. If something goes weird, it never has, but, um, Oh, I know those people though. Yeah, oh boy. They, do I know those people? people. <laughs> and I, I've even talked a couple of them into getting on the microphone. Cause I'm like, come on, you work at the place too. talk about the thing. Um, but, um, but yeah, and I think because when people realized what it was, the consistent feedback we were getting early on was like, oh, I didn't – I had no idea this is what it – we were just talking. We were just talking. And, and and what made us feel really good that we were following an angle that made sense was that um, the feedback we were getting early on was like, hey, given the timing of this and everything that's going on, like I love my team at work, but we don't see each other anymore because – covid so everybody's divided up and split up and isolated um this feels like it's a chance for me to hang out with some friends every week and that that meant the world to us so we said okay so i think in a way like we've talked about hey we should probably tighten up this and we have tweaked a couple things about the format of the show we've made it shorter overall because of consistent feedback we've gotten from people but 
it, it felt like it was fun for what we wanted. We saw a lot of other people filling other niches in the in the sort of field, and th- we said, "This is great. Let's just keep doing this." Um, and then the fact that all of the other sort of higher ups in our company never gave it a thought of wanting to like give us any sort of approvals like steve gave us a thumbs up and we ran away with it we we bring him on the show every now and again to be our guest which is great um and he will he will sort of you know pimp the show to everyone at every opportunity he has which is pretty great but um but yeah i think that's what it was it was just informal people talking about stuff i think because ari and i both have a background in stage work um we're really comfortable improvising on our own we're really comfortable improvising with each other so i think more than maybe some people we can just always go with the flow put us in any situation you know give us a five second explanation of what the situation is and and like i will just adapt to it and that works really well for this because we understand someone has to you know, dead air is the one thing you don't want with this. Right. And I can cut that out to some point, but when you've committed to saying, I don't want to cut anything out, um, then, uh, then it, it keeps it lively. And, and it's, and it's been wonderful because, um, you know, people recommend it to others and that gets new guests. And, and just like Elizabeth said, I'm, you know, we've even been able to pull people in from outside the animal field, which has been super great. I've sent a couple very strange messages over, Twitter and Reddit and other things saying, hey, this is going to sound like it came from out of nowhere, but would you? And in almost every case, people are like, oh, heck yeah, that sounds weird. I'll do that. <laughs> yes. Two of my favorite personal episodes are I reached out to my favorite uh, band, which is just kind of getting started, but they're like really amazing. And I know the bass player, but um, and I had them on the podcast, which made no sense. I did it as a bonus episode, but uh, we talked for two hours and um, I had an actress who has nothing to do with animals. Um, but she was on Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul are my favorite television shows. And um, she seemed cool and approachable online. And um, so I asked her if she wanted to be on the podcast and we've become friends and we stay in touch. And um, we, we've talked about like next time I'm out in L.A., we'll probably hang out. And I'm just like, what? how does this make sense? So I just did a, a bonus episode, you know, casually about being on Better Call Saul for acting. And, you know, it, it worked. It, people, cool. people downloaded it and I, I abused my powers to get it to hang out with that person. But, uh, you know, yeah, it's a, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> Yeah, once I exhausted my list of like mom friends that I knew in the field, it was like, all right, you better get real comfortable with like cold emailing people. And just like you said, Chris, out of the blue, being like, hey, I know you don't know me, but here's the premise. This is the podcast. I found you this way, you know, whether it was Facebook or through an AZA listserv, which I have found guests on. What do you think about this? And I had one girl one day ask me, she's like, where did you, where did you find my name at? (laughs) I was like, this this is real embarrassing, but I basically kind of stalked you on Facebook. Like I saw that you had children and that you worked at a zoo. I mean, those are the only two criteria at this point. (laughs) (laughs) So do you want to be on? Um, But I mean, agreed. Like no one has turned me down. Like almost every single guest has been like, yeah, I do want to do that. That does sound amazing. Like, I think that would be really cool. And I'm like, all right, then let's get it done. Let's do it. So I will say that the evolution of mothering wildlife. I mean, we're still evolving, right? We're only 30 something episodes in. Um, but you know, I met John through Rasafari and that's how (laughs) we got to know each other. I was a guest and I just kind of like very nervously, I think that second time you were at the zoo was like, Hey, I, I kind of want to do a podcast and I have this idea. And you were just like, yes, I think that's amazing. Let's do it. And I'll help you out. And you pitched this idea to help me with it. And I'm sure it took me a very long time to commit. Very long time. (laughs) That's that's my memory of it. (laughs) Because I just, you know, hemmed and hawed and don't have time because with children, like it's just in that my kids are little. It's, you know, sometimes chaotic. I don't have a lot of time, but I hemmed and hawed and we were going to do this. And I don't know, maybe we'll release on Mother's Day. That would be so perfect, Mother's Day. And then that came and went and (laughs) we didn't release on Mother's Day two months later. But, you know, having John it, to help me kind of with like the audio side of things and, you know, stitching together like my intros and my outros and the in- interviews and stuff like that has been really helpful in terms of giving me enough confidence to kind of ease on into it. I mean, it 
it is very easy nowadays to start up a podcast. There are so many resources out there. There's so many like web, you know, websites that can give you information, help you do it. But I think I just was nervous to dive in and being able to have that support from someone who was clearly successfully doing it and was like, no, man, it's fine. Just just jump in and do it has been the biggest thing because it kind of took some of that pressure off. So thank you, John. Well, I'm glad um, to hear that. That means a lot, honestly. <laughs> That's really nice to know that because I love, I love being a part of, I love being the father and mothering wildlife. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? fathering wildlife. <laughs> no, but I, I'm glad because uh, I, I, I remember you were so nervous and I was like, but you're awesome. Just do the thing. You're like, you just have to start. And yeah. I was like, yeah, I know. But what if, what if, what if? And then we just started and, you know, my basic concern was going to be if this is a weekly podcast, like, will I even be able to get enough people to come on as guests to keep up with putting an episode out every single week? Um, and I think, you know, once we just started and like that was the expectation, then I just found the guests like it just has happened. And and so it at this point in time, like is you know, I'm, I'm, I'm working a couple weeks ahead of myself, which is not as much of a cushion as I would like, but like that is, it's just, we're just doing the thing. Like, you know, you just got to do the thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah and the, the feedback I've given to so many different people, because in addition to getting that feedback that, you know, this is fun and I'm glad you guys are doing this. Like there's been a couple people that say, Oh, I, I, I've thought about doing something like this. Or my team talked about like, what if we did this? And it was just about pinnipeds. And that that's always been my, like my not so joking bit of feedback I give to people is like, I, I believe everyone should have a podcast just because I think it's fun. And you know, it's, it's not back when I started doing this, um, for, 12 years ago oh my god um you know that it was an established thing it existed um there were people doing this from like 2004 2005 or other things we would now call podcasting to even before that but it really wasn't you know at the level that it is now i mean and, and i can grab most people's phones and sort of say you know what's in your library and it's a it's a lot and you know whole genres and professions have grown out of this but the thing i'm continually amazed for is if you can think about any specific part of any specific subject that you are interested in there is a resource out there and there is a community of people that's out there and i think the community part of the zoo industry which is probably one of the things that's kept things going for the three of us is that you know i i joke a lot that despite what you may see if you go to a conference or a large organization like i firmly believe there's only about a hundred people in the whole zoo industry all over <laughs> planet earth because if i don't know you I know somebody, you know, or I know yeah. your boss or your boss was my boss or it, it's just it's so crazy. And even just scrolling through because I wanted to verify, I was like, wait, I think Elizabeth's show is what Ari was on. I'm looking through that. I was like, OK, Courtney. Yeah, yeah she worked with my wife. OK, there's Ari. OK, good. There's oh, there's uh, from Riverbanks. Yep, I know them. And so same thing with John's show. It's like, oh, yep, there's Robert in Toronto. Oh, there's Steve. Hey, he's my boss. Wait, he did this. OK, cool. <laughs> um, so it, it's it's such a small field. And I think you know, we talk a lot about like, hey, do you imagine that when, I don't know, like a doctor decides he's going to go on vacation with his family to like a different state? Does he reach out on some message board and go, hey, fellow doctors, can I meet <laughs> up with anyone and like go to your hospital? But like we do that all the time, right? It's not I, I, I'm oh, well, I'm going to be going up to Montreal for some reason. OK, what facilities are up there? Do I know anybody there? Does somebody I know? Okay, can I reach out? Hey, would it? Can I come hang out and see yours? Like people are so happy to show off what they do and share what they do. We're all proud of what we do in this field. So I, ha I think having this outlet is is super cool. And having people work in this field who either because of commutes or because of parts of their day when you're just doing like discrete independent work like husbandry or something like that. And, you know, we don't have to have big, huge you know, ear cans on our head anymore. We can stick these little things in our ear and listen to other people talk as the day goes by. Like John said, like I got a lot of time on my hands, so I'm going to listen to podcasts. So why not add your voice to that? That's always my recommendation for people. Yeah, I think, I, oh, well, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. I was oh. just going to say, I mean, I used to be worried that, you know, zoo mom was such a specific niche. It's like, you know, we're talking about the zoo field in general, like you're saying, like it, it's small, it's inbred. We kind of joke about that. Everyone knows everyone. But now I'm taking a tiny little subset and I'm just talking to moms. And it was like, is that too niche to make a podcast? Will anyone even listen? And I've kind of really been surprised about 
how far it, ha- it has reached and how many people have been like, oh, no, yeah, this is totally needed. I'm so glad that you're doing this. Like, I can't, I wish it existed years ago. Like, it just, it's it, it's not too small. Like, it's just proved to me that it definitely is important to, you know, the bigger mission. And building on that, I think that's one thing that I've I've really come to realize is that having a niche is really important. You know, I'm I'm the inside outsider now and I'm I'm to a lot of people kind of a trusted source. A lot of people tell me when they're changing facilities, they're looking for a new job, they will listen and and if someone if a place hasn't been on the podcast, they reach out and ask why. And sometimes it's just there hasn't been that opportunity yet. But I've literally had people reach out and if I'm like, oh yeah, no, you know, I I I tried five times and they're just not interested. They're kind of like, oh, what are they hiding? Okay, I'm gonna look at some other places. I've heard <laughs> stories like that, you know? And it, it's it's a really cool niche. And I think the zoo news thing is also a, a, a very cool kind of niche thing. But I have heard stories from PR people that I've gotten close to of people that send emails to these zoos at, that, that will say things like, hi, I want to start my own version of Ross Safari. Who can I talk to and what animals can I meet? <laughs> and it works zero times. You have to find something that is a niche that, you know, you are contributing, you're, you're adding something new, you're adding your own voice, your own take. Um, and you also, I think, have to do it for the right reasons. I think mm-hmm. all three of us got into this because of being passionate. And, and you know, everything that we said, no one said, oh, I want to, you know, advance my career. I want to meet a bunch of animals, whatever. As a matter of fact, the first time that I actually got to go to a facility to record because, uh, you know, COVID was at the start of this. It was all online like this. You could have knocked me over with a feather when they're like, you want to meet some animals? It had never even crossed my mind. And now I've met, you know, hundreds of species and it's the most amazing thing. But also when a facility is like, yeah, no, we don't, you know, we're not doing any. I'm like, oh, OK, that's not what we're here for. That's cool. Um, and, and so I think having that niche and also like having an authentic passion is is what matters if you just try to get into it for your own benefit you'll be lucky to get an episode and and you're not going to make it a year most likely which something like 95 percent of podcasts don't you know yeah i mean i even feel very protective of my guests and the stuff that i'm gonna put out on social media when i'm trying to like just simply like put it out there that there's a new episode you should listen because I kind of feel like, cause you know, I was talking to someone and they were like, well, you know, why don't you just ask them for like, you know, pictures of themselves. You can put that on social and you can like, kind of like blast it as like, this is the mom is who we're talking to. And I was like, I just, I just have some sort of moral feeling about that because I am asking these moms and I are having a conversations that, you know, some of the things we talk about are just very personal not, I mean, they're obviously talking on a podcast that they know is going to be, you know, put out for the world to hear, but like these conversations and some of the topics are, they're things that like you talk about with your mom friends, not on a microphone and birth and, you know, whether you choose to breastfeed or not. And some, you know, whether you're co-sleeping and, you know, some of those things are very polarizing and like the mom sphere and the parent sphere. And I don't ever want a guest to feel like, number one, uncomfortable. So I always give them the option to opt out of any topic that they're not comfortable with. But I also don't want them to feel like now I've just gone and like splashed our whole entire conversation all over social media just to get some likes or just to get, you know, the popularity of the podcast to increase. Because again, that's not what it was truly meant to be, was really trying just to target those zoo moms who might want to hear another story and who can like recognize themselves in it and might, you know, make them feel less alone. It wasn't out there to like be the biggest, fattest podcast that had millions of listeners. And so I do feel very protective of like those guests and and what, you know, they're choosing to share with me that makes sense. (laughs) No, totally. Yeah. That's actually something I struggle with sometimes because my goal is to blast, not to grow the podcast for my own sake, but I I think every one of these stories should be heard by every person out there. I think Ross Safari should be mandatory listening for the entire world, not because of me, (laughs) but because my guests are amazing. And what happens in this industry is amazing. And I get so inspired by them that I've gone from a complete outsider who just liked to go to them to volunteering for Red Panda Network, helping out with like, uh, you know, some voiceover stuff for Penguins International. I'm now volunteering at Aquarium of Niagara. I, I am as in this industry as I can be without 
quitting my day job and being in the industry. I've even gotten to uh, consult on a couple of training things where people just wanted a set of outside eyes and they know that I've become obsessed with your podcast, Chris, and with the Abma podcast and just like reading books and stuff. And I've been able to help a couple times. So like, I think I want everyone in the world to experience that, you know, and it's such a weird thing because I, I want everyone because of that to, to be like listening. But then, like you said, sometimes it gets really personal. Um, and, and, you know, the zoo sphere is a pretty safe place. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of anti-zoo people, are not going to spend an hour to two hours a week listening to my podcast. Um, and you know, it's not quite the same as like when they follow, you know, social media and, and make snarky comments. Um, and so like, it is kind of a weird safe space. So I I'm constantly struggling with that balance as well. And I've, I've had people tell me things like you said about ways to just kind of blast the content. And I'm always torn between like, I want to grow this. I want everyone to hear it, but I also want it to be a safe space. And it's, yeah. It's a weird line. Yeah. Because of course I have to blast it to some extent because I want it to find those listeners that we're looking for, but I don't want to blast it so much that like it, you know, it reaches this little like inner circle of like the people it's intended for. I don't know. It's just, it's, it's hard. <laughs> well, and I think that that's, that's probably a thing that, that, that John's got to feel in the other side of his life too. Like one of the cool things last year, I had an opportunity to go see the U2 residency at the sphere in Las Vegas. And you've seen a lot of interviews with those guys of like, you know, how do you pull off when, when your job is to connect people. And I think as a podcaster, that's what you do. And I think a lot of musicians feel that way too. They want to connect with their audience. Um, when you're in front of, you know, 15,000, 40,000 people, how do you make that feel as small as possible? And I think that that's, that is a thing that, you know, we, we try to remember, too, is, you know, that we became aware the first time we started going to host uh, training workshops and then go to conferences because Ari was on the board of the bird trainer organization. I'm on the board of ABMA um, that there were these nervous people coming up to talk to us that mm, we didn't really understand what was going on because I'm used to people just. I can go up to anybody at any conference in any field, just start bleh, and then we're all used to it. But then, and I would find out, Oh, it's because like, Oh, I really, really like your show. And I just really wanted to say <laughs> thank you. And it's like, Oh, there's, I fangirl over people in the zoo field. And now people are doing that over us. That's weird. But, um, <laughs> but it's also, it's nice. And I think that that for me, we've discussed that before that, that to me feels like a pretty good way to know that quote unquote it's working as opposed to like looking at, you know, numbers and stuff and obsessing over that was if I ever get any kind of feedback that says, Hey, you did this thing. And it really meant a lot to me, even from one person. It's like, okay, well that's got us for at least another 30 or 40 episodes. We're going to keep doing this. And, um, I think, you know, the only commitment we made as loose as things were, was we are going to do this every single week, no matter what. Because reflecting on my previous experience, I think the reason it never really grew into what I wanted it to be was we were super inconsistent. And the only consistent feed that bit of feedback I ever got from anybody else was if you're going to do this, you got to do this. So we made this we made this choice in our minds every Thursday. Something goes up and it, it's going to happen. And we have never failed since 2020. So we're really proud of that. Um, but it is it is wild when you when you hear people coming up, up and and letting you know that a thing that you said meant something to them. And I think that, you know, Ari, my co-host, has always said the biggest, biggest reinforcer for her is always when one of our coworkers lets us know that we did this because those guys literally have to listen to us talk all day long. <laughs> and so to choose to do it on their own time, I think is just blows my mind. I can remember one day I was leaving work and as I was standing at my car, a, a coworker pulled up beside me and she rolled down her passenger window and just stared at me. She didn't say anything. <laughs> and I just looked at me and I was like, Hey, <laughs> and she did, didn't say anything. And she just started smiling. And I realized my voice was coming out of her car speakers and she she was just like, that's weird and peeled off and drove away. And I was like, oh, man, that that is that is wild. Anyone cares about this? That's cool. <laughs> yeah, I have cried at some of the messages that I've gotten, you know, hormonal mom over here, <laughs> but I re <laughs> all the time. But I really have because I have just been so touched that someone took the time to send me such a nice message about how much a certain episode they listened to made them feel and impacted them and 
I don't know. I didn't expect that when I started all of this. And I have literally cried, if I'm being honest. I'm like, oh, my God. Like, oh, and then I'm like, okay, I'll keep going. Like, it just like... <laughs> I have felt that. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it's it's amazing. I mean, there are people that are in the industry because they heard my podcast and were inspired and joined the industry. And that mm -hmm. blows my mind, like quit their job. And at once they found something in this field and that's, that, that that kind of thing blows my mind or people who make huge donations that I could never afford to do, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but I will say talking about conferences, Chris, um, my first AZA conference, which was uh, not the most recent one, but the one before that mm -hmm. was the most mind blowing experience because I've been doing this and I talk to people and, you know, a lot of times I'll go to a facility and I'll have a couple of fans. Like you said, there's that thing of like, you know, someone's kind of shy around you and all of a sudden you realize that that's why. Um, but at the first AZA conference that I went to, people were screaming Rossafari when they saw me or people were were shyly coming up. And, and like you said, saying, you know, what episodes impacted them, quoting me or my guests to me <laughs> like word for word. And I, like you said, I, I don't script any of this stuff. I don't remember what they're talking about, I, like word for word. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. And it was it was such a crazy, like heady experience. And I, I remember I, I told Zoe, my wife, like. Nothing will be better than this. Somebody even shouted Ross Safari at her. And while she's like on there from time to time, it's not like we post her pictures and stuff. She's a more private person. So the fact they recognized her and, and made a big deal about the pod to her was pretty intense. But then I went to the second of the AZA conferences that I've been to, the most recent one. And it was completely different. Not because I was recognized less, but because whereas the first time I was in novelty and people were like, oh, Rasafari, bah, now I was just part of the community and people were coming up to me and, and talking to me about, you know, guests or about episodes. But it was as opposed to me being a... um you know, kind of the, the spectacle that I was, I was there and, and, oh, here's this, this podcast guy. And I was just like, oh yeah, it's John. We all know John. He's John's cool. Now. And yeah. He's, and he's well, been accepted. Yeah. And like people were coming up and like, Hey, I'd love to do an episode. And I'm like, Hey, cool. Um, you know, or I'd go up to people that I wanted to talk to that I was inspired by and I'd be like, Hey, so my name's John and I'm from, and like at least a half of the time they'd be like, yeah, yeah. Ross Safari. Right. Yeah. 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 No, let's yeah. What's up. And I'm like, well, that got easier. Um, so that was actually more rewarding to me in a in a different way. Although I, I did miss the first one where everyone was just shouting Ross Safari and being goofy. But <laughs> but yeah, it's it's really, really fascinating. And you know, Chris, you were talking about fangirling about some of these people. I mean the people that I have had on my podcast, I literally I've been a zoo fan my entire life. And now that I'm in it. I'm still, like you said, I'm just a big fan. The fact that Steve Martin has been on my podcast is crazy to me. And the fact Amy uh, at NEI told me that, like, he talked about really loving it and that he couldn't remember the name and all of you guys were doing research and trying to find me. And that, like, at a staff meeting, there were a bunch of NEI staffers, people I respected for years just looking up and trying to figure out who John Rossi is and Rossafari. And I was like this, this moment that she remembered and I'm sitting there and I'm like, this is crazy to me that they're even, that they even know I exist <laughs> is crazy to me. You know, it's, it's really trippy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and speaking <coughs> of trippy, I'm kind of curious. Um, so, you know, we talked about this a little bit, but what has the experience, whether, and it's not even about numbers, like you said, but what has the experience of, of having, for lack of a better word, fans, I, I often am loathe to use that word. I say listeners a lot or our community, but call a spade a spade. There are fans out there. And, and what, what has that um, experience been like for y'all? Cause I I've had a weird one. I will say that, um, it it's a reminder for me and this has been a lifelong issue it, it's funny like we <laughs> we had a group of people who were we were all instructors at a recent training workshop that we did and we're all people who we interact with people every day where all of us are people who are on stage to one aspect or another and one of the um one of the instructors we were doing this little q a thing with the students of the course at the end of one of the days he just made this offhanded comment about like well, you know, I mean, it's kind of what you can expect when you've got a group like us sitting up here um, who are all like really gregarious introverts. And like we kind of looked at each other and we're like, OK, our job is to be in front of people. We like being up on top of a stage like I I, I 
wanted to pursue the job I have now because I was told, Hey, they've got an 1100 seat theater at this big theme park. You should, I was like, yes, that's exciting to me, but I'm very, 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 very shy in most other aspects of my life. And, and by all accounts, extremely introverted. And I think one of the things I've always struggled with is knowing how to gracefully take compliments praise and allow myself to be proud of things that other people tell me I should be proud of. So I, it's been a little bit of an exercise of like really wanting to be appreciative of that and try to ask those folks for a little bit of information about, you know, how did you learn about it? What did you like about it? Is there anything I can do better? Um, that's a big one for me is, do you have any feedback for me? Which is not something those people are ever expecting. It's like, <laughs> I like, I'm glad you like the thing. How can I change it? Um, <laughs> But but I mean, it's so so I think it's fun. And I think the 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 most fun thing for me is not when I see people talking to us about it and telling us that they're fans. It's when I see them talking to other people about it. And I mentioned something in that same workshop about a concept or a resource. I think I talked about crucial conversations, which is something we talk about a lot on on our show. Yeah. And uh, one of the students raised her hand. She's like, oh my gosh, yes, it's a great book. And I learned about that book from Chris's podcast. And I they did a book club and they did four episodes. And we're sit both of us are sitting here and I can feel our faces are getting like beat red because it was like, I didn't bring this up, but I guess we're gonna ride this wave now. Um <laughs> and yeah, it's 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 super cool. And I think that since we thought of it as like this is a way for us to connect to other people it was just validation of that like it, it's just like okay yes this this did what we wanted it to and um and then the joke for me is that if you ever give me any feedback that you have heard the show like this show liked a person on the show the result of that will be i will invite you on the show so it's <laughs> it's a promise and a threat and i have never failed to do that every single person who said something i was like well let me know how to get a hold of you because if you like that then maybe you could be on one too Almost everybody has said yes, too, which is pretty exciting. Nice. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it has been kind of, I've had lots of um, guests say to me, I had one girl who was like, I saw your email come through in my e inbox and I just thought, I thought it was spam. She's like, I just was shocked. I was like, there's no way that she's reaching out to me. And I was like, well, really? Because I mean... <laughs> this is a baby podcast, like, you know, not on the same spectrum as you two right there. She's like, no, I just, I really was like, oh, she wants to talk to me. She wants to talk to me. And I was like, yeah, I mean, I, I do like, I don't, you know, we're just having a normal conversation with a normal person. But, um, besides her, there has been one other girl that's like, yeah, I mean, I listen to every single episode and it's so weird to see your face now that I, I only hear your voice every single week and now <laughs> I can see your face while we're talking. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I just, I'm, I'm just me doing this podcast. So <laughs> that's, that's that part I didn't expect at all. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I remember the first time I, I hung out with uh, a very regular guest who has also, you know, been on your podcast, Elizabeth, uh, Danny Poirier Larson, yeah. um, and and Emily Begay as well. Um, I walked into the room and I was like, hello, because literally Danny was just like, we were texting and she was like, just let yourself in. And I was like, okay, because it was at her house. And so I walk in, I was like, hello. And they both go, ah, it's so weird to like, hear your voice coming from a human <laughs> rather than a speaker. And because I'm a big nerd, I almost actually um, played my podcast theme on my phone as I walked in. <laughs> Thought it would be funny and I regret not doing that. But, um, but it is so funny to me, like seeing what people think of, of you and how big you are, how small you are, because podcast numbers aren't out there. They're not public knowledge. There are some charts and they're very suspicious at, at best. Um, <laughs> And there are a lot of third party sites that will tell you what your numbers are compared to other people. And they're just not true at all. Um, and so sometimes you even question the official numbers for reasons, but that I don't yeah. want to sound like a conspiracy theorist. But sometimes I've seen things happen where I'm like, this doesn't make sense, but whatever. Um, but like I had a person reach out recently and they were like, hey, John, I'm sure you get millions of requests like this a day. And I was like, and they, they wanted to be on the podcast. And I was like, I I don't. I get I get requests, but but not no. And no um, yeah, and I, I'll have people reach out and be like, Mr. Rossi, we would love <laughs> to have somebody from your team reach out to us. And I'm like, it me. I'm my team. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was one facility that they emailed me and I called them right away because I just happened to be free. And the the person I spoke to, the PR person was literally like, my phone rang. And I was like, it can't be. I just sent this to him. And I was like, 
yeah, I'm pretty excited. Let's do this. <laughs> but then there are also people that are like, like there are people that reach out to me to discuss every episode and I'm happy and I, I've gotten to build some great relationships from it. But occasionally I get the impression that they, they kind of think they're the only person that listens. And it's, it's just so funny to, to see how some people are literally like, Hey John, as your fan, like your one fan, I, I thought this. And then how other people are like, if somebody from the Rasafari team could reach out and, Oh my gosh, we actually got, john um you know but then you also get weird things like um oh elizabeth you'll you'll uh, so you know as as you've been going through things i have offered some advice from time to time and as i was editing one of your podcasts recently i was going to give you a suggestion that you could take or not and and just right? just give you a, a suggestion and there's a <laughs> reason i didn't no there's a reason <laughs> i didn't and that is at the beginning of every episode you have your introduction where you you know the the pre-recorded introduction where you introduce yourself mm -hmm. and then you start off and every time you say hi welcome to mothering wildlife <laughs> i'm elizabeth your host and i'm like girl <laughs> We know. We know. Your <laughs> listeners know. And you just said it in the intro. And I was about what to give you crap for that. I was Someone about, listens well, to it the first time. <laughs> but I was about to give you crap for that. And then I realized that I have literally had people who have listened to every episode of my podcast and send me enough stuff where, like, they comment on specific episodes. I believe them. They are listeners. And the email starts off and it says, hi, Ross. And I get it. It's Ross <laughs> Safari. I get it. But and I was like, oh, dang, maybe maybe I should be introducing myself more. <laughs> right. And I'm not going to tell Elizabeth not to do that second introduction, because while I hear it, and I'm like, girl, we know. Get to it. <laughs> uh, apparently, people aren't always paying that much attention, exactly. you know, and it's amazing to me that, that people have reached out. And literally, like I said, they will comment on five, six, seven episodes. They really listen. They really care. And it starts with, hello, Ross. Oh, man. Wow. You know, my 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 um defense will be that moms are just busy and only, only half paying attention to what they're doing and listening to. So, like, so they're going to miss it. Although I have been trying to, oh, gosh, I have been trying to sound more enthusiastic in that second intro where I'm like, hey, I'm so excited you're here. And I'm like, but is that me? I don't know. And I, I just love myself. when you're real, <laughs> especially when you share stories of like hard parenting moments. Yeah, I well, there's it. one coming up. Because oh, <laughs> there's times that you and I have texted, because even though I'm not a mother, I am a father. And um, there are times that you and I have had a conversation about your intros or whatever. And I find myself like getting emotional because like i'm like I, I feel that way and i don't really well, talk to a lot of dads it. you know it's it's pretty cool yeah yeah i have had people tell me no because i i asked um and i asked on an episode i guess or maybe online somewhere like do you guys like to hear my stories do you not like i don't want to i don't want to bore you if you're just like oh gosh she's talking about her kids again but most people are like no because we want to hear them because then we're like oh the she's going through that too and they told me i literally cried when you told that story and i was like okay well that you know that's why i shared it because i was crying and there had to be someone else crying and someone else was upset and i know i'm not the only one that's done this specific you know had this weird mom moment and yeah so yeah. you have to connect somehow and if it means i have to put out a little bit of my crazy kid stories or life or mom experiences and i'm happy to do it because it is what it is. Mm -hmm. And I think being yourself is the most important thing. That is that is something yeah. that, that people me. tell me time yeah. and again and again. And early on in the podcast, I was trying to be like the next Bill Nye. I was trying to be very just not me, very just whatever. And um, a, a couple of friends who listened were like, where are you at, dude? And uh, I literally remember I was like three or four episodes in and I cracked just a really bad pun and my guest lost it. And I think that probably saved my entire podcast because from that <laughs> moment on, I was just like, oh, no, wait, I need I need to be myself, even if it's a kind of dumb, silly version. Yeah, not version. I mean, it's the true version of myself, but I'm dumb right. and silly at times. And, and that's fine. I am curious, though, you both mentioned something which I, I find endlessly fascinating which is getting um feedback and you know i have done things myself where i'll like ask questions on my instagram or i will ask questions on an episode and and you know people will, will send their responses and 
I I sometimes find myself struggling with like, I want to be what people want it to be within reason while still being myself and being true to myself. But also like, you know, I will get, let's say on a really good day on Instagram, you'll get maybe 200 responses to uh, a question, you know, and not all of them. It, it's never like a hundred percent. A lot of times actually my stuff's like 50, 50, which does not help at all. But, um, you know, it'll be 75, 25, whatever. And I'll get 200 responses. And then I think there are thousands of people that listen every week. Should I let what 75% of 150 people said now we're doing all kinds of math here you know but should that shape the experience of these thousands of people and so I, i'm curious how you guys process any suggestions or things that you're told or whatever and um you know how you how you stay true to yourself but also think about that stuff i think for us it was about i think because it <laughs> I, I i mean i i think we ultimately do if I get down to it, like I, I think we're ultimately doing the podcast for ourselves because we like it. And if we didn't like it, it would be work that we would always find a reason to avoid and we wouldn't be putting it out every week and it probably wouldn't feel the same. But because it's fun, um, you know, we've, we've talked about there's there are episodes that we finish it and we're like, that was fun. Like maybe somebody will get something out of it. And then there are ones that you're done and you're like, that was important. And that's the one I'm actually going to like, OK, I'm going to make sure that when I'm editing, I'm really paying attention to this and. I'm going to be really careful with my write up and I'm going to share this episode ahead of time in a way that I normally wouldn't with people. Cause I like, I think it's important for people to hear this because of something we got on, which was not planned or because we have an incredible guest who went down a path that we, you know, didn't, couldn't have anticipated. But I think that since we, since we did realize, yes, <laughs> we're doing this for ourselves and it needs to be fun, but like, we are putting this out for other people to listen to. Right. And we're curious what kind of feedback we would get. I think the, the, the two main things that we've changed and I think we were comfortable with it was because this started during lockdown. Um, we were always recording from home. Like you said, John, we, everything was remote. There was no in-person version of this, even for the two of us. And, um, so one of the things we did at the outset of every episode early on was, we we would talk about, you know, we'd be like, what you drinking tonight? Because it was always we were always recorded at night. It was after work. And then um, how's your quarantine? You know, we'd talk about just like what hey, you because know, we were really open about this is what started the show. At some point, we'd been doing it long enough. We're like, well, that do we have to talk about this anymore? Like, it's kind of like it's never going to be over. But like it's, you know, we it's not this is not we're back at work. Like we're seeing each other. We're recording live sometimes. Let's just not do that anymore. And then um, we had a couple guests who, you know, when we asked the question about like, hey, what you drinking? They would just sort of be like, oh, I didn't mineral water. I don't know. And I got the sense. And then somebody finally mentioned it, that they were like slightly uncomfortable about it. Not that they had a problem with drinking or anything, but just that like. I don't know. Like it seemed like, you know, they were here to talk about like <laughs> a breeding program they were working on at their facility or something. And like, you know, all of a sudden we're like, check out this beer I found this week. <laughs> um, so we got, we got rid of that. And then, um, and then uh, there was a thing about overall length and it's something we still struggle with because we had a couple people on, on our staff who said, you know, sometimes you guys get on a tear and it's great. Other times I know things can wander a little bit. Cause I know you don't plan anything. Um, but, um, but when you guys can get those episodes where it's like, 35 40 minutes what i like about that is i can listen to the whole thing on my drive to work and it's just a really nice way to start my day now i know that's not the use case for everybody but um for those people it was like great and then the other adjustment we made was you know we were so busy at work and then because we're both members of senior management in our company work kind of never stops um so because we're doing work stuff at home as well to do this also at home when we've got families and things like that like it just it did start to feel like a little bit of a drain. So we sort of committed to saying we're going to record this thing at work. Um, but because we're still members of our team, there are many days where it's like, if we're going to do this at work, we're going to have to do it on our lunch break because it doesn't feel right for us to use work time to lock ourselves in an office and goof around about animal stuff, even though like our staff respects that they get it. I am sensitive to the fact that like, yeah, if I'm doing this, I'm not helping you guys i'm not washing dishes i'm not on stage doing the show so um so that kind of naturally 
condensed the time anyway, because we were often trying to fit ourselves into a one hour block where we didn't before. So I think those are the main two things we changed. And they were just it. So one kind of from our closest listeners, our, our, our teammates, and then one from from guests we had on the show. And those felt like adjustments we were super comfortable to make. Yeah, because I'm so new and I've only got like 30 something episodes. <laughs> I think that mothering wildlife is still, you know, there's still room to figure out what this looks like. And and I, I besides the, the positive feedback that I've received, I haven't had many conversations um, about what should change, what needs to change. I've just been trying certain things here and there and and still playing with it. So like, I just, I just don't have the longevity yet. Um, but yeah, I... I would be and will be totally open to um, suggestions from listeners because I want to keep it as me, like myself, like this is who I am and this is what it's for. But also like you guys are saying, the small things you've made, that makes a big difference sometimes for a listener and, and there's no harm in doing that too, you know? Mm-hmm. I think for me, what I've done is I, I take all of the feedback and I ask myself if it rings true to me. Mm -hmm. And if it does, great. Like when I first launched Zoo News, it was just me talking. There there were no other, none of the the fun little sections and parody songs and breaks and all of that. And it was just random story after random story. So it was a giraffe was born at this zoo and uh, rhino numbers are up in Kenya this year. And that's exciting. And, uh, oh, a wolf died at this zoo or whatever, you know, and it was a blah, blah, blah. And once I broke it up and all that stuff, it, it you know, I had a couple people who were like, that's a cool concept, but wow it's a lot dude and so that that rang true to me and i was like yeah i was kind of a lot recording it too so i i whipped up some parody songs and came up with some ways to do it and i'm still you know you say you're a baby podcast but i had made major changes by my 30th week you know and but also like i just recently made some changes to to zoo news in particular a couple weeks ago i started um I kind of always start with a, an update on John because people have asked for that and I would never do that otherwise, but that's what I do. And then once we go into the actual zoo news section, I would always start with births and deaths. And, um, lately there, there've just been a bunch of kind of stories that I've wanted to go a little deeper on and a little, and so I've started putting one story at the beginning. I have a headline. I mean, and this makes sense. This is what every news program does basically and then i get into the smaller stuff and um that's a change that i think i made a month ago but the feedback has been really good about it and i'm i'm really excited so yeah i I think it always evolves but there have been things that people have said to me and i'm literally like eh, no that can be someone else's podcast and you're one voice out of you know thousands that listen and i appreciate it like i would never say that to them but like there are times that i just have to remind myself because it's very easy at least for me to hear one person say one thing and be like ah you're ruining your podcast you have to change everything flop sweat and it's just not that you know yeah so yeah yeah i am curious if any of you guys have any thoughts or things that you've been wondering about Yes, I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity (laughs) uh, for something very, very specific. And it's something very dorky. And I hope that people will uh, follow us with this. And I think maybe John even teased it when we first started talking about this. So, um, you know, my show did something kind of similar to this, where we brought together some podcasters from some other shows. And and we sort of got to talking about, you know, uh, how did your show start? Some similar kind of things that we're talking about tonight. But um but one of the things I missed out on that I'm just personally very interested in is um, some basics about the recording process. Like what microphones are you using? What software do you use? How do you edit? Um, and I- I'm just I'm curious because I think it answers some things for some other people who are they've gone beyond the like, oh, I want to do this, but I don't know how they've now said yes. And now they're like. God, I wish I had somebody I could talk to about this. And I guess I can get on Reddit forums and I can go and I can Google things. And yeah, but like, uh, um, so like you said, John, and, and you've, you've done this with Elizabeth and I've done it with ABMA and we've, you know, it, this idea of supporting each other there. So like, how, how do you guys actually record and edit your shows? I'm going to start with Elizabeth. Oh gosh. <laughs> Well, as I learned everything that I know from John, <laughs> <laughs> I do use clean feed 
um, to record my audio with my guests, which is super easy to use. It's pretty intuitive, even for someone like me who is technologically challenged. I mean, so technologically challenged. Wow. Say, we have had more <laughs> ep- issues with your episodes than we have with 400 of mine. Just saying. Yeah. But go ahead. I, I love you. It's true. I was telling John before you got on, Chris, that um, pretty much every single episode we spend the first 10 minutes of like i can't hear you no can -hmm. you maybe do this no okay turn the zoom off and just connect with clean feet nope that didn't work okay try to go into your system like literally every single episode and because i you know i'm 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 getting better at troubleshooting, but so anyway, I do also use clean feed, which is a great program. Um, and it does produce very high quality audio. That sounds really great. And it is actually pretty easy to use because it's just going to send a link to your guests. They can click on it and then they're going to basically tap right into like the little recording studio. You can record easily. You can save it easily you, you know, right off down onto your computer or wherever you're going to do it. And it's it's not hard to use. But then I do also pair the visual part of our recording um, through Zoom so that I can see who we're talking to. And when I can't get clean feet to work because I'm technologically challenged, then I just record our audio over Zoom. (laughs) And John's told me some little tips and tricks of how to kind of like make it sound better and make sure you're recording, you know, multi-tracks and the the echo and the it's like, you know, um, what is this this setting that you're supposed to do on Zoom? It's like for artists or something. Original sound for musicians. Yes. Yep. (laughs) So... Sometimes my episodes are recorded through Zoom and sometimes they're on clean feed. Um, But after I have the recording, um, I will usually actually just use Audacity, which is, I think, a pretty common um, program for podcasts and things like this, especially if you're going to start out. It's easy to use, too, and I record all of my intros and outros through Audacity. I can save it as MP3. And then John and I actually have a system where we both... um, he is, um, I, I don't even know how to describe that through Dropbox. <laughs> what is it? I've shared my Dropbox mm-hmm. with yeah. you yep, yep. and, um, he can just come in and see where my audio is and then he can take it from there. So I will put it into Dropbox and then he comes in and he gets it out and he does his magic with it and stitches it all together and voila episode. Voila. <laughs> voila as simple as that <laughs> you'll yes. bounce it back and sometimes we'll bounce it back and forth and and i have even learned some things recently in the past couple of episodes uh in audacity how to like um either amplify a guest's audio if it's really quiet usually those times when i've had to record over zoom and it's been weird or i can like kind of make some tiny little cuts myself now where i don't even have to like email john and be like okay the sentence starts with this and it ends with this and can you cut it out and it's at this time stamp blah, 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 blah. that's just a lot it's way easier for me now that i've kind of learned how to do it and kind of make it like it doesn't sound like it's cut i don't think and it kind of fades into it like i've I'm really proud of myself for learning how to do some of that in Audacity um, and then being able to just like shoot him a nice clean snippet of interview that he then doesn't have to go through and cut where I want him to cut it at. So that's kind of how we've worked that out. I think it's working okay. Yeah, I think it works great. And I think that's something for a lot of people to remember. Like, there are people like me out there that are happy to help with that kind of stuff. And, <laughs> and um, you know, if you have a friend, you could get them to do it for free. If not, people will do it for fairly cheap. Um, there's a website called Fiverr where there are people that will do things for five, ten bucks an episode, you know. And um, I think it's pretty healthy. I think it's a pretty cool thing to do because there are people that know audio pretty well. And I <clears throat> happen to be one of those people. So my <laughs> uh, my conversation here is going to be pretty nerdy. I do a lot of in-person interviews, but when it comes to the online, um, like Elizabeth said, I use clean feed for our audio as we are doing tonight. I use Zoom for video. And also if I ever have tech issues with the clean feed, um, you know, you can capture that Zoom audio. And then I put the audio into Logic Pro, which is Apple's answer to Pro Tools. Um, so it is like a very professional, you know, recordy thing that I already had as a drummer. It's like a three or $400 program, but I was already recording music on it. Um, and then on that, I have one thing that I have found from looking at some of my stats is that 
audio quality really does seem to matter. And I thought it was interesting, um, Chris, when you guys did your other summit of podcasters, which I was not invited to. I know. It's one of my great regrets. That's why I'm here tonight. (laughs) But uh, it also inspired me to do this. So, you know, (laughs) Um, but it was a great listen. And uh, you guys were talking about a lot of times the audio quality doesn't seem to matter that much. Um, But in my experience and looking at like how much people listen to episodes, which you can see on some of the apps, it tends to. Now, I don't think it matters a hundred percent if things are a little echoey or whatever. But when I do my in-person interviews every room's going to be different sometimes we go on exhibit there's all kinds of stuff so i have a bunch of plugins that i have learned how to use there are times that on a single audio track um i'll have 9 10 11 plugins running and uh, everything from compression to um a thing called a deboxer, which makes certain mics sound less boxy and, uh, you know, ways to remove sibilance so that when people say a sizz really hard, it won't hurt your ears when you listen. Um, and I'm really into all of that kind of stuff. I have so much fun crafting an EQ profile for each guest and then going in and, and making everything just sound awesome and stripping background noise as best as you can. And, Sometimes you can't. Sometimes there have even been a couple episodes where I've reached out to actual professional audio engineers that like I have toured with and been like, help. And they they do. They're friends. But even then, it's not what you want. You know, it, it happens. Um, but in general, I'm really proud of of the work that I'm able to do and little tricks that I've learned, like panning interviews so that it's not two voices right in the center of your ears when you're listening and, and stuff like that. Um And then as far as mics, I have a Shure SM7B, which is the gold standard uh, vocal mic pretty much in in the recording industry. Uh, Michael Jackson used one of these to record Thriller, and it's it's been really hot ever since. And that's what like these these podcasts that make millions of dollars, they all have those. Um, And that goes into a Scarlett 2i2, which is uh, what then plugs into my uh, my computer and I use something called a cloud lifter to make my audio louder and slightly cleaner, um, which is another device. So I have this whole setup that I can connect and it's brilliant when I'm home, but then I go on the road and I used to take uh, a couple, um, a couple like, uh, sure SM 57s, which are kind of the most common vocal mic that you'll see anyone from, you know, Mick Jagger to Taylor Swift using, uh, on stage. Um, but I recently found this thing and I'm obsessed. And if people want to do in-person interviews, I can't recommend it enough. It's called the DJI two microphone. And it is, uh, I have it downstairs. Darn it. It is roughly maybe the size of like a pack of cigarettes. Not that any of us have probably had one of those in a long time, but maybe even a little smaller. And inside it, when you flip it open, There is a receiver that plugs directly into your computer and two lavalier mics that connect immediately to it. And it works like AirPods, where as soon as you flip the lid up, all of the connections get made and everything's ready to roll. And each mic can record on its own. It it has memory in each mic, but also records to your computer. So I plug this little thing into my USB-C drive and we each take a microphone and we we can talk and I get two channels clean and each mic records. So if the connection gets lost, I still have clean audio from each person speaking from the microphones. It was like a $250 investment and it has changed my life. I used to have to take a bag that was huge and would um, literally cause my shoulder. If I had to go on long walks through the zoo, I would get like um, marks on my shoulder. <laughs> And now I take a thing that's, like I said, the size of a a, uh, pack of cigarettes. And that's what I record on. And if we're going to go and we're going to go in with animals, we just leave the labs on and hit record. It works. Um, But I'm constantly on the search. I love uh, audio technology. And even though I mentioned all of those things, I have probably three or four other mics that I've experimented with and may go back to at some point. And, oh, I'm a huge nerd with all of this stuff. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I don't have a fancy mic like that. I just have a Yeti, <laughs> which I think is a very popular brand. And, you know, like those probably way more affordable if you are going to try to test your waters with podcasting. Yetis are awesome. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yetis are I like very it. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. What do yeah, you use, Chris? The, yeah. I mean, it's a combination of things. So I am still using 
bits and pieces of that original $100 um, podcast setup that my wife gave me at home, um, which I don't record from home very often anymore. I sometimes will. I'm, it's more meetings than I'm in. So I don't even usually break out the microphone anymore. I just kind of use, you know, whatever's attached to the earbud that I'm listening to. But, um, but I do, uh, <laughs> I do like that one. For those of you listening, don't know, I am sending Amazon links to John saying, is it this thing? It's um, true. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it's the right thing. Um, that's awesome because it is solving a problem I've wanted to solve for a while. Um, but, uh, yeah, no. So I've, it, this has a basic little mixing board that I've found settings that I'm very comfortable with when we are recording at work, we each have, um, a Yeti mic. So that was something we were able to convince our boss early on, like, Hey, this is not the cheapest thing in the world, but it's not expensive and we need one and you need one and we need to get them. And cause it's like kind of the standard and he's like, well, okay. And our boss is kind of a tech nerd too. So that was not a hard sell to tell him we needed to buy some new toys. Um, and, um, so that works well. He has since upgraded his mic to something beyond that. I don't even know what it is. He went on a journey of his own, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think, uh, b- both of us ended up both area and I each ended up with two yetis. So I think we both have one at work and we both have one at home too. Um, I don't know where my home one is. It's probably in my luggage. Cause I sometimes take it with me when I travel, but, um, and we are oftentimes using just the audio recorded straight from zoom. If it involves other people, um, because I didn't know about clean feed, but that's probably going to be my new solution now. Um, and, um, you know, just the when I started doing this, the kind of bog standard way that you would get most people to do these things was, OK, I need you to I need you to download this program. And so when we talk, I need you to hit record and then we're going to count down. We're going to three, two, one. And we're all going to clap so I can see what it looks like on the thing. I just made John spit water all over his recording <laughs> studio. Um, and um, because you remember those days. Oh, the clap um, is so real. The, yeah, yeah. I, I still use it with my DJI mics just to, you know, make sure they all sync up. Exactly. Yeah. The things drift. Audio drifts. I don't know why it just does sometimes. But um, so um, we're oftentimes using that Uh, when I discovered that, you know, recording to my computer meant that I got separate audio tracks instead of just one track where everybody's dumped together. That was a big game changer for me. Um, And now when we record at work, um, I'm the new software that I've been messing around with that I kind of like I need to learn more about is called Audio Hijack. That was something that was recommended by some other folks I knew who were doing podcast stuff. It was really inexpensive, but um, it it. It's a very sort of graphic user interface of, you know, all the stuff that John was talking about. You know, I can get the compressors and the VU meters and the peak meters and I can just drag them onto this screen to, to connect, you know, this is where the mic is on the left. Here's where your recording is on the right. So it's just visual representations of all the different things. Two mics. Cool. Just tell me which mics they are and how you want it to dump together. So it's just a fun little puzzle that I've kind of been messing with. But um. But yeah, and 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 then audit uh, editing through Audacity, which is where I started, and I'm I'm still doing it. The program I think is it's begging me to kill it because it it crashes more often than I would like. And um, <laughs> but I've I've, <laughs> I've learned its ins and outs enough that um you know for, for me the the challenge was we had this um this thing that came up at work where my boss challenged uh, uh the managers in the company. He said if there's anything in our operations that you were the only one in the company that knows how to do it. We're going to look at that as a weakness and I'm going to need you within the next two months to train at least one other person to do that thing. Because that way, if you get hit by a bus one day, which we used to say all the time, we have now changed it to say when you win the lottery one day and decide to disappear, which is much nicer, but more um, of a positive spin, <laughs> then, you know, they're operationally, we can keep going. So I actually had to, I had to go through and explain in a document how to record and edit a podcast. And that was a fun challenge for me because I was like, what do I need screenshots of? How do I explain what file hosting is? How do I explain what it is? And then going through and saying, okay, there's a billion things you can do, but what you need to understand is amplify. You need to understand noise cancellation. You need to understand, you know, so those little settings that I can remember the day that I accidentally found out that I could mute a portion of a track instead of have to like, cut it and then stretch it back out to its original length just because i like i literally like hit command l by accident and i went what and it like changed everything so yes yeah, the very essence of self-taught um uh but yeah it, it it works for us and it's one of those things that i am uh, anything that involves electronics and techie type stuff like i have to be careful with myself because if i wanted to say like just going to start digging a little bit into this rabbit hole it's probably not that deep right i'm just going to see where the bottom is then i it it would be bad and then i think the other thing is since i wanted this to continue to be 
a thing that really was focused on work. The, the, the primary things for me were cost efficiency. Um, and you know, there are times when the, the episode is getting edited hours before it goes live. Like we have, we've, it, we we're just over, we're about 204 episodes now. And I think maybe three times we've recorded before the week that it goes live. We don't bank anything. We never have. And I think that was the, what a smart person would have did. We, we talk about this a lot. A smart person would have said, we're going to do a podcast. It's March. We're going to start in June. But until then, let's just start recording and recording and recording. And re nope, we didn't do that. We said, we're starting next week. So we every now and again, we'll record two or three things in a week. And then that gives us some breathing room. And we're both very busy people. So I think when we figured out, I, I could get Ari to understand what she needed to do so she could do the show by herself. Uh, and then, you know, please, please, please record to the cloud so I can get access to all of the information afterwards. We've been able to solve every challenge that we've come across. Um, it's not always as clean as we would like, but I think it works pretty well for us. But yeah, I think, John, like you said, because, you know, the arms race of quality in this sector is just, you know, I... I'm never going to have 16 producers and, you know, you know, uh, go ahead and chase Joe Rogan and Mark Marin if you want to folks out there. I, I don't think there's a point. You probably shouldn't. Um, but but you can get surprisingly close. You can get surprisingly close. And it's funny because when I will talk to people on our show, there's that moment when I if they sound crystal clear. I like make a note for myself. I was like, when we're done here, I want to know exactly what they have in their setup because they <laughs> sound amazing. Yeah, I love I, I I've gone off that cliff like like that you were talking about, <laughs> because while I knew how to record and like I would not recommend logic or pro tools for anyone who is just getting into it. Audacity is very user friendly. There are other ones out there, but um, this stuff is not <laughs> it's not at all. And um, they just assume that you are a, a engineer, which I like, I guess I kind of am now, but not really. Um, but when I started to get into uh, I, I didn't need to know any of this stuff for the drums that I record. So it was a whole all of these literally dozens of plugins that I have for for logic. Now, I had to learn you know, kind of on the fly. And, um, it, it is, it is an interesting every once in a while I'll find myself, it's like late night. And, uh, in, instead of having one too many drinks, I'm buying one too many plugins and I'm like, Oh, John, <laughs> what are we doing? Um, but I'm, I'm proud of the audio. As a matter of fact, uh, there was a, a company that I, I worked with for a while called daydreamer media. They did a, a series of podcasts that I was a, a part of for about a year. It was like an experiment and it, it didn't get quite where they were hoping but it was it was cool to be a part of and um they would basically you could pay them to produce your podcast mm -hmm. and when they were first pitching the idea of partnering with me to me um i was by far and away their their biggest uh podcast just coming into it um you know they had talked oh we'll help you with merch we'll help with this we'll help with that it was very cool and then they were like all right now we're gonna have our like chief engineer talk to you and i was like in my brain i was like ah here comes the sales pitch. Here comes the, you know, you pay us $20 a week and we'll, we'll make it sound crystal clear. And she was like, your podcast sounds amazing. Great work. Thank you for, for, you know, if you ever have any questions, we can talk, we could figure something out, but like, keep doing what you're doing. I was like, heck yeah. Cause this is like a real audio engineer. And, yeah. and I actually know I have a few, uh, you know, regular listeners. Uh, I still struggle to say the word fans. I don't know. It feels weird, but, um, who are like perfect, like one of them works for NPR and as an audio engineer. And, uh, they, they have commented many times about how great things sound. And I'm like, Ooh, nice. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. Thank you for indulging that. <laughs> oh, I, I could talk nerd talk all day. Elizabeth, did you have any uh, questions you wanted to ask or anything you were thinking about? No, but I just have a comment on the audio still. It is my biggest stress because I am solely doing interviews, not in person. <laughs> and you never know what the guest is going to show up with and what they're trying to use, even though you try to tell them you know what, what is the best. <laughs> and so it is... It is, I'm getting better at it, but it is like my biggest anxiety, um, those first 10 minutes when we've both tried to connect and one person sounds awful and the other person sounds great and, or I think it sounds great. And then I listen back to it after the whole entire interview is done and I'm like, wow, I can barely hear this person, which has happened a couple of times. Um, so yeah, it can be stressful, but, um, I do, I am, 
I am getting more into being able to troubleshoot it and I, and it's actually really interesting. So I think it's, it's nice new skill set to learn. It is. And I have found that it can help you with some other connections. I had Hillary Henke reach out to me and I love Hillary and she's been on the podcast and she reached out one night and she was like, John, I'm releasing a podcast episode tomorrow and my audio is shot. Here's what's going on. What can I do? And I was like, email it to me. And 10 minutes later, she had workable audio. Like, was it perfect? Yeah. No. But did it sound better? You know, it was listenable. <laughs> Her original one was literally not. Yeah. And I, I I loved being able to do that and to help out, you know, another just amazing person who I've mm -hmm. known about for years. And not only was it cool that like she was on the podcast, but then when she had an audio issue, she thought of me <laughs> and I was able to help. That's so fancy. That is cool. Yeah. yeah. It makes yeah, me really happy. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. Um, I, I'm I'm curious, you know, as as we talk about this stuff, and I know we should probably wind down here, but um, I, I want to ask, what like philosophy do you go into your interviews with? Um, and I'm not going to lie, there's a thing I kind of want to talk about about this, like with what I do. So this is a very self serving question, but um, just as far as like when you get into an interview, what are you thinking? What are you you feeling? I know we all improvise this stuff. None of us go into it prepared, except for when we have to, and that is usually done kicking and screaming. But um, you know, so what what are you thinking when you go into to this situation? Elizabeth, it feels like we should let him go first because I know. He knows <laughs> Right? John, do you want to start us off? Oh, fine. I'm really excited about Twist this. Twist your arm. Well, I just recently came up with this when I was talking to a friend, but I realized how true it is. I treat every interview like a date, which means we are on a very hot, you know, interesting date right now, friends. Now. But Exciting I, for me. I, <laughs> but I really, really do. And the first interview is like a first date. And I want to get to know the person, but I also want to let them know who I am. And I strive to connect. And I really just like, I mean, you know, I'm a very, I'm, I'm a, I'm a helpless romantic. And when I am on a first date, I'm, I'm expecting things to go well. I'm not one who goes into this thinking, you know, oh, this might work. I'm like, oh, this might be the love of my life. Or at the very least I might be getting some tonight. So, you know, whatever. Now I don't think that with the podcast, just to be clear, I have a lot of married guests. <laughs> oh, <but> <laughs> your past guests now are like, I know, right? Okay. <laughs> this, yes. No, but no, but seriously, like I go into a date you know, with the attitude of this is going to be great and we're going to find a way to connect and we're going to have those magical moments over breadsticks and like all the things, you know? And so that is how I treat like a first interview. I really do. I just want to get to know the person and all the cool best stuff about them. And then as we go into it and as people have been on multiple times, you know, Elizabeth, uh, you've been on a couple of times and like Danny's been on both as a guest and a co-host a bunch of times. And it's, it's like a, you know, your fifth, sixth, tenth, twentieth date. You you can joke with each other. You can reference past things. You have inside jokes that the audience is in on. But just like with the date, where I get that sense of excitement and like that that slight like good nerves, not like bad nerves. That's really what it feels like to me every time. And actually, what triggered me even remembering I wanted to talk about this was Elizabeth when you said when you get on and there's an audio issue right away. It literally is like when you get on, like to me, it's like when you're on your first date and all you get there and the reservation, they can't find it. It's like frantic. Or there's a kid screaming at the restaurant <laughs> and you're like, no, no, I want this to be so good and I want it to be magical and I want this person to think I'm awesome and ah, and like, yeah. I don't know, when I had this realization, um, it really like it defines if you if you go back next time that y'all are listening to one of my podcasts, especially with the new guest, just listen and you'll hear how excited I am and how fun and into it I am. And it, it's literally that is what I'm like on a first date. And uh, I just I don't know. I've always found that to be uh, since since I realized it, I'm like, oh, yeah, that defines my my whole podcast personality. <laughs> so, hey, if anybody in the industry is listening and you want to go on a date with, John, I mean, if you want to be on the podcast, you know, hit me up. <laughs> I will say that I have been trying really hard to just make our conversations on on mothering wildlife as organic as possible 
because I want it to feel like for the guests that they're just talking to another mom about things that they would talk to another mom about, especially a zoo mom, because we share so we have so many similarities about what we're experiencing. But then I do want people who are listening to the podcast to feel like they are just listening to, you know, a couple of moms talk or listening to their own mom friends talk. Um, because I, it is not scripted, obviously, and, and I do send questions out ahead of time um, with a very broad statement of like, hey, here's some standard questions. We may or may not get to them all. This is just so you kind of know how the tone of the conversation might go. However, I, you know, always strive to make this a very like organic laid back conversation because I don't want them to be nervous because a lot of times they are very, very nervous. <laughs> they told me. Um, and I want them to just feel comfortable like they're just trying to talk to another mom friend, which is just really important to me. So that's kind of my philosophy. Just talking to your best friend. <laughs> Yours sounds less creepy than mine in retrospect. <laughs> <laughs> a little. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, I'm, I'm Follow like, those I'm, up, Chris. Good luck. In my, in my brain, I was like, well, God, there's two of us hosting this show. So what additional <laughs> throw into it? My co-host and I saw you from across the room and we liked your vibe. <laughs> right. Um, it's a whole different part of creepy. Um, well, <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's very similar to, uh, I think, what Elizabeth said, but also with the desire to have the excitement that John's talking about, too, of like, we are legitimately interested in people. And I think that we've continually been reinforced for the idea that the teams that we see doing amazing things with animals and doing the best job uh, for the care of those critters in our facilities are the ones who are parts of really healthy teams and really healthy teams are made out of people who exhibit a certain set of behaviors that tend to help support that team dynamic, that growth of a culture where people know that they're supporting each other. So, that everybody can fire on all cylinders. And I think there's research to back up that, you know, when we don't do well by each other as humans, it is harder for us to do well by the animals in our care. So we're trying to figure out with every person that we talk to, like, what is it that you're bringing to the table in your team um, that you found to be successful for you, both because we want that shared broadly with as many people as possible, because we know the people side of things is what a lot of people struggle with in our field. And I'm, I'm continually reinforced for that. I, I should have mentioned pretty early on, in addition to the other stuff I do with the company, I act as a consultant um, in, for zoo training in a, a pretty big part of my job uh, pre COVID and uh, still a lot of what I do now, less so than I used to, but I travel a lot to other zoos and um, I'm, it's amazing for me and, John already touched on this, this idea that when you go to a place and you're not part of that organization, it is shocking how quickly some people will become comfortable enough to tell you certain things that they probably haven't even told their teammates and their bosses and stuff like that. So um, what I've kind of seen over and over again is this sort of crisis of human communication in the field. It's like we have all these incredible people who are capable of amazing things, but because we're humans, we get in each other's way a lot. And it's frustrating because a lot of us aren't raised with the skills that it takes to be good humans and good, you know, partners to each other and to prioritize kindness and things like that. So um, I think for us, it's wanting to bring that enthusiasm and that kindness from our perspective because it draws it out from other people. And I think because we are genuinely interested in every single person we talk to, it's we never have to fake it. Like it, at best, I don't know anything about them. And then that that's its own thrill, right? Like I'm going to get to talk to this person. Um, and I have the additional thrill that sometimes my involvement with these episodes is that I don't get to see what happened until the recording's already been completed because I wasn't a part of it, but I edit all of them. So, and there are some that given the timing of things, all I have to do is read some notes that say, hey, we had a hiccup about 15 minutes in. Uh, they said this thing at like 25 minutes, they asked me to take off. But like, other than that, it was great. I will go in, I will make sure those things are accounted for music at the front music at the back, throw a blooper in there and boom, post it. And then I listen to the episode later, which is not my preferred way to do it. But I have done it before. And I am still excited by that. So um, somebody asked me the other day, like, do you listen to the show? Like, and I said, yeah, at this point, yes. But it's mainly like when I see it pop up on my feed. I want to see that like the first couple minutes sound as good as I thought they did. 
And then I might scrub through to listen to some transitions. So, but there are some still that I'm like, I had so much fun talking to this person and I was so fascinated by what they said. I don't remember what I said, or I don't remember what my co-host said. So I'm now going to actually listen to this conversation. And isn't that a cool gift we get to give ourselves, Mm -hmm. right? That we get to not only have the opportunity to meet these amazing people, but we get to have a document of it. I think that's so cool. One of the neatest things that I heard um, years ago was um, I got I was able to be a guest on a a video game related podcast that I really liked at the time. And um, this guy had been doing it for a long time and had a very, very niche thing, but like had its fans and his wife for, I think, either his birthday one year or an anniversary, got him a hardbound book of the transcripts of every episode he had recorded up to that point. Oh, wow. And I was like, <laughs> your faces are the exact same face that I made when I heard that. Cause I was like, that is amazing. And it's funny. Cause now I, I hear ads for companies that will like do that with, you know, your family members, like, Oh, you know, have a monthly conversation with your grandma. And then at the end of the year, like we'll, we'll make a thing. That's a doc. It's a scrapbook, but it's an audio scrapbook. And um, I love that. I have all this stuff on my hard drive that is just, you know, these interviews and these interfaces with people. It's just, I feel so lucky that we get to do what we do. It's so awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you just saying that just like dawned on me. I was like, wow, I basically now have almost a year of my life recorded in this very specific season of life that I am in with the children that I have and the professional career that I have and the conversations I'm having with these guests. And you're right. Like, how cool is that? (laughs) Because I can go back and listen to that 20, 30 years from now and be like, God, yes, I do remember feeling all of those things and having those conversations and and doing that podcast and talking to those guests. and, And that was cool. Like, that is cool to have that kind of recorded. <laughs> it is. And I just recently had a revelation um, like a week or two ago. So Lynn the Red Panda uh, passed away at the Cincinnati Zoo. Mm-hmm. And I did a little special like bonus thing because I I loved Lynn. Lynn, Lynn was a hard animal for sure. And um, I had done an interview with her keeper, Paul Reinhardt. He was like a full episode about Lynn and the other pandas there. And it hit me um, that, you know, in that episode, we talked about a bunch of different things. And Lynn has passed away and Kenji, her mate, has moved to a new facility. He's at Roger Williams Park Zoo now. And um, their cub at the time, Lucas, uh, is now at San Diego and is a father. And the cubs that are at Cincinnati now were not born yet at, at the time of this interview. And uh, one of the staff members that I, I talked about was was no longer there. And um, as as I was listening back to like cut out some audio for my little bonus thing, it hit me that every episode not only tracks my journey with the, with the stuff that I talk about in zoo news, like you said, Elizabeth, but is a beautiful snapshot of a moment in time at one of these facilities where thanks to births, deaths, careers, AZA, you know, SSP moves, all that stuff. It's never going to be that way again. Possibly a week later, it will never be that way, you know, again. And, I don't know. That really hit me. It's a really beautiful, like snapshot. And, and over the years, the places I've gone back to and the people that I've had on multiple times, um, it's like a snapshot, then a snapshot, then a snapshot. It's it's like, you know, having a bunch of yearbooks or something and I can look back and I can just be like, oh yeah, it was this. And it was the most beautiful thing. And then a year later I was there and it was this, and it was the most beautiful thing. And now it's this, and that's, kind of the most beautiful thing and i don't know it 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 really it really hit me in a good way um and actually it's you know also chris talking about what you're saying listening back it used to be my habit when i started that every tuesday morning i would start making my breakfast start listening to raw safari on the feed partially to make sure that it was you know like you said as good as i thought it was and partially just because in all the editing sometimes i get so focused on what does their voice sound like that i forget what their words were Mm. um and as life has moved on i'm not able to do that very often anymore i'm a wildly busy person and and trying to keep up with other stuff Uh, but i was just recently saying to zoe i really think I need to start doing that again because I feel so connected to those people and it just it's so rewarding it is such amazing reinforcement to listen to this thing you know right under Conan O'Brien needs a friend or whatever and it has the great audio quality and it's the stories I'm sharing with people and honestly when I listen back it doesn't even feel like I'm listening to me 
in, in a weird sort of way. It's like I'm just listening to a podcast that I love, and I, I kind of miss doing that. I think I'm going to start doing it again some more. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Does anyone have anything else uh, before I have one final wrap-up question? I don't think so. All right, no, real quick. Good. Elizabeth, most surprising thing that has happened to you on this journey? Um. <laughs> well, probably those people that take the time to reach out. I don't know why I didn't expect that you, you kind of, I should have, but that has been the most surprising for people to be like, I listened to so-and-so's episode and I was considering leaving the zoo field or doing something uh, similar. And they inspired me and kind of made me feel like I was making the right decision. Like someone taking their time to tell me that, like I facilitated that, like I did that. That's been the most surprising thing for me. Chris? Um, I'll go with something that was kind of recent that I found out that was pretty cool. Um, AZA, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, recently updated some basic information about um, like development resources that are in the field that they recommend to organizations and to people within zoos. And then, you know, and um, my organization was mentioned and they talked about, um, you know, we, we do in-person training and consulting. We do shows. We help other organizations set up shows. So it was mainly talking about our in-person workshops that people can come attend. But they mentioned they also have online webinars, online courses, and even a podcast. And my co-host, Ari, sent to it. She's like, so I guess this show is now like an AZA-sanctioned professional development tool. <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's pretty cool. And um, it was just a fun little joke that we have with each other. But it, again, it's just another version of that reminder that oh god people are listening and that's amazing yeah absolutely for me it's been like i said there were people that have like joined the field or like picked new facilities based on what they heard on the podcast and and just uh people that have donated money to to you know conservation organizations and zoos and stuff like just all the little impacts but i think the number one for me is just like there have been a couple of times now where zoos trust me and get to know me really well and something happens and they're like John, who do you know that knows about this stuff? Can you connect me to someone I'm trying to save an animal's life right now? Or, you know, I'm trying to figure out we're having a welfare issue and we really want to take care of this animal. Who can you connect me to? And a couple of times it's even been, like I said earlier, you know, John, we're having this issue. Can you be a fresh set of eyes? If I explain this to you, can you tell me what you see just from everyone you've talked to? And being able to help in those moments and, and know that I'm impacting like an animal's life because I'm a drummer with an animal podcast is just, amazing to me and that that matters far more than whatever the numbers say each week that's cool yeah nice. yeah all right y'all well we have we have rambled who who knew that three uh <laughs> podcast hosts would talk a lot but uh that's strange yeah so weird but uh thank you both for doing this it has been a blast yeah thanks for facilitating it i'm happy to be a part of it yes great to finally get to see and meet elizabeth and yes, thank you john true. for bringing us together <laughs> this is super cool <laughs> All right. Well, I hope that was a fun ride for y'all. And if not, well, too darn bad. It was fun for me. And that's really all that matters in life, right? No, I kid. I kid. But uh, hey, I want to take a moment to say thank you to all of my patrons, especially my Red Panda level patrons, Dr. Laura Shank, Dr. Stephen Williamson, Barbara Bennett, and Jenny Owens. And uh, I'd like to remind y'all that we'll be back here on Friday for a Zoo News episode. But also, please make sure that you go and support Chris and support Elizabeth if you think those niches that we talked about might pertain to you. Make sure that you go and and you uh, follow along with Mothering Wildlife and the NEI Tech Talk podcast. Uh, they all have cool artwork and great music and awesome people and yay. Also, you know, animal stuff and, and things like that. So, all right. Uh, yeah, I hope you all have a very good rest of your day. And remember, friends, the word credits backwards is Stider. The Ross Safari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Rossi. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Ross Safari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Ross Safari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo.
being a mother in the zoo field and the uh, wilder, wilder, wider, wider was the word I was looking for. 